Good evening. I'm Dr. J.R. Rudsky. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd also like to thank Kathy Pulford and Sibley for all their hard work to make this interaction possible. It's obviously been a very challenging and unusual year for all of us, but the fact that we can get together in this format and still discuss shoulder problems and treatment options, I, I think is, is something we're very fortunate for. I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Sibley. I've been there, this is my 15th year, and I specialize in shoulder surgery and sports medicine. Tonight's focus will be rotator cuff disease and shoulder replacement. This is my disclosure slide. So I've always been fascinated in the shoulder starting in medical school. It's a minimally constrained ball and socket joint, unlike the hip that has intrinsic stability from the bony anatomy. And there's a trade-off with this of mobility for stability. I like to explain it to patients by saying it's like a golf ball sitting on a tee sideways. And that gives us many elegant planes of motion that you simply can't get with your hip. So there are static stabilizers, which are the joint surfaces and the ligaments, and dynamic stabilizers, such as the rotator cuff and the muscles that help to keep our shoulder blade in position. The ligaments are structural thickenings of the capsule. I like to explain this as a hammock at the bottom with a structure like a dry fit t-shirt that you would wear to work out in. It's very compliant or stretchy. And just like you see this person tilting in the hammock, when I come back here to throw a baseball, the ligaments in the front are gonna tighten. And when I go here to block somebody in football, the ligaments in the back are gonna tighten. And that helps to provide stability to this intrinsically unstable joint. The biceps tendon you may hear about if you have rotator cuff disease or shoulder arthritis. The biceps muscle is named by because it has two heads. One that travels, as you see here in this picture, outside of the shoulder, and one that travels through the shoulder and can frequently be involved with inflammatory disease in the shoulder, such as rotator cuff pathology and arthritis. The rotator cuff itself, what is it? Well, it's a combination of four tendons that are connected, forming a cuff of tissue on the top of the humerus, which help to stabilize it by compressing it into the socket when the deltoid fires. Those are three muscles with a common tendon on the top and the back and one in the front. So I think one of the most important things to be educated on as a patient is the natural history of rotator cuff disease. At some point in our life, over 50% of us, if we live long enough, we're gonna have a rotator cuff tear. And as you get familiar with this, you start to understand the natural history. Meaning that under the age of 60, rotator cuff tears are uncommon when we're talking about full thickness or complete disruptions of the attachment of the tendon to the bone. As opposed to partial thickness tears, which are quite common in elite asymptomatic overhead athletes in their 20s and 30s. But as we get over age 70 to 80, over 50% of the population will have a tear. So these are incredibly common and they come in lots of different forms. This makes the etiology, meaning what caused the disease and the biology of each individual patient critical considerations whenever you're talking about possible surgery. There are multiple factors. Patients say, well, what caused my tear? Was it that dog that pulled me in the park? Was it you know, splitting the cord of wood in my yard? Or, that time that I slipped and fell when I was skiing? And the answer is, this is a Venn diagram with multiple overlapping circles. And what all these things allude to is, at a microscopic level, there's mechanobiology involved. There are gene expression and cellular things affecting the collagen and the tissue of the individual tendons in all of us. Some of those were predisposed to, some of those were acquired with repetitive stresses and strains if we're rowers or tennis players or swimmers for 50 to 60 years. Some patients can have impingement. This is a little bit more of a complex concept and one that we don't wanna just simplify and say, oh, it's all because of the impingement. We learn more and more over time about the immune system and its effect with inflammation on rotator cuff disease. And finally, my research has been focused on vascularity and blood supply to the rotator cuff. Plain and simple as we would intuitively assume with time, with life and with age, our blood supply is not as robust at 60 to 70 to 80 as it is at 10 to 20 to 30. And when you do a pooled analysis of patients over the age of 40 and under the age of 40, you find roughly a 50% reduction in blood supply to the rotator cuff 
that in conjunction with these other factors you see here contribute to the evolution of rotator cuff disease in certain patients. So we could subdivide these into traumatic tears and degenerative tears. The traumatic tears are injury-based. They're acute, injury-related. They typically have less retraction or pull-off from the attachment site. They have minimal atrophy because that tendon was attached so the muscle is healthy, and they have a higher likelihood of healing. These are sort of good tears to have, if you will. Degenerative tears are common. They're chronic. They're not traumatic. They present insidiously where someone doesn't say, hey, I just fell off a chairlift and now I can't lift my arm. They say, you know, over the past sort of three to six months, I've just had this kind of progressively worsening ache and pain, and now it's harder to lift my arm and I feel weaker. I didn't have a clear specific injury that I can recall. And these frequently can be accompanied by atrophy because what you've had is sort of the progressive attenuation of the tendon with a partial tear or a full tear that's evolved over time and sort of peeled back chronically because the muscle of that tendon isn't working in a normal fashion and undergoes atrophy and fatty replacement. These have a lower healing potential and so we don't want to jump into surgery for these tears unless there's a compelling reason. So I draw this really simplistic slide of the smiley face in terms of who does well and who is less likely to do well. Well, when it comes to surgery, smaller tears, excuse me, <coughs> smaller tears that are acute and traumatic in patients under 65 years of age with less atrophy who are non-smokers and non-diabetics. These are patients that are gonna do quite well with surgery to fix a rotator cuff tear that is a full thickness tear. Who does not do as well? Large and massive tears that are chronic and degenerative with atrophy in patients over the age of 70 that have a lower healing potential and patients who also have a lower healing potential that smoke or have diabetes. So how do we fix the rotator cuff? If, if you look back when we're in medical school and we study histology, it's fascinating how tendons work to power and position our bones in space, whether it's in the hand, whether it's in the elbow, the shoulder, all the mechanisms we do. A muscle is going to be thousands of cells that are tiny and, and able to generate large amounts of force for a very small unit of area, but they can't act on the bone individually. So they have to coalesce into a junction of a tendon and then that tendon has to attach to the bone, but that happens through five layers, and this starts in the embryo. It's, it's really extraordinary. And this slide, what you're seeing here, back here in the upper left corner, this is healthy normal tendon tissue. And then you see it undergoes a five layer transition where it sort of fuses with the bone. And that's something that we can't reconstruct just like you know, God gave it to us when we were born, but we do have a way to sew it back down to the bone, get it to heal and scar in, and that has been proven over time to be a durable repair that can last 10 to 20 years or more. So this is a video here. And we may be having a, a problem. I could give a link to people so they can watch this video later, but it's an arthroscopic video showing how we fix the rotator cuff. This is done through small one centimeter incisions in the back, the front, and the side of the shoulder with a high definition fiber optic video camera through which we put instruments to simply sew the tendon back down to the bone. So we'll take questions on rotator cuff disease at the end of the presentation, but now I'd like to segue into shoulder arthritis. Shoulder arthritis is a degenerative condition of progressive cartilage wear involving inflammation, pain, stiffness, and motion loss. And one of the things, understandably, that patients can get confused about is, well, doc, I have arthritis everywhere. Well, we might, but it's different in every part of our body. We can have osteoarthritis, we can have inflammatory arthritis, such as lupus and rheumatoid arthritis and variations of that. But just because you have arthritis in your spine or your hip doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get arthritis in your shoulder. Every joint is individual and specific. When we talk about specifically shoulder arthritis, these four issues lead to impaired function over time. You get narrowing of the joint space from cartilage wear, bone spurs from cartilage wear, and articulation of bone on bone. So 
one of the things that patients will often ask me in the office is, well, can't you just put a camera in there and trim the bone spur down? Won't that take care of things? And the answer is, technically, we can do that. We have the technology and the technical ability to put a camera in and trim that bone spur down, but it won't help. The bone spurs are secondary to the fact that the cartilage is gone, bone is rubbing on bone. And so in a rather maladaptive process, the body forms a spur trying to enlarge the surface area of the joint to give it more stability when that's actually not what it needs. And then we get ligament contractures. And so I showed you before what a capsule looks like in the ligaments of the shoulder and compared them to a dry fit shirt that you would work out in. Well, when you get arthritis, that dry fit shirt tends to turn into a canvas duffel bag or a coat that's too small and really tight and stiff. And so we get progressive inflammation stiffness and thickening of the capsule. And when we go into the shoulders of these patients who have severe arthritis, we find that instead of being lax and excessively stretchy, that capsule is incredibly rigid, stiff and tight and thick, which leads to motion loss and pain. And typically that motion loss tends to be a loss of external rotation, which is rotating out to the side, a loss of forward elevation, which is lifting up, and coming out to the side and coming in the back. And those are things that we work hard and pay a great deal of attention to for restoration when we do our replacements. And then you get progressive deformity, which is erosion of the socket. And we'll talk about that tonight for, for a bit. This, in the top left picture here, you see a normal shoulder. There is good joint space remaining here, no bone spurs. This is a normal shoulder that is progressing over time, and we followed this patient over years to early arthritis. So this is a patient who comes in the office and typically says, you know, I've been having intermittent discomfort for years, but it's sort of periodic and I'll get some flares and they'll get better, but now it's been bothering me over the last couple months and I'm having night pain, it's harder to put a coat on in the winter. And we get this x-ray and you see a bone spur here and you see narrowing of the joint space. And then you look over time with progression and you start to see sclerosis where you're seeing white thickening of the bone here, the bone spur down here in deformation, the head is no longer spherical. It's now becoming flattened or pancaked and deformed. Then this is an advanced case of arthritis where you see obliteration of the joint space, that white thickening of the bone called sclerosis, which is sort of like turning to marble. You see profound deformity of the humeral head and then a very large spur down here at the bottom. So what are our options when we're treating arthritis? Well, we want to reduce pain and inflammation. So we commonly, as a first line measure, we'll use anti-inflammatory medications. We'll talk with patients about icing the shoulder and careful activity selection. It's unbelievable how many patients can simply alter their fitness regimen where maybe they're focusing a little too much on uh, planks, push-ups, chest press, and other activities. And um, maybe they're doing swimming a little too often or playing a little too much singles tennis. And if we modify that and get them to cross train and use other muscles, they can still be fit and they can still work out, but then they find that their pain is reduced for, for uh, a sustainable period. Then we talk about cortisone injections. Synthetic lubricant injections have recently been demonstrated in the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons clinical practice guideline to be of no benefit. So that's something that we have used in younger patients in the past who are quite poor candidates for arthroplasty. Medicare and insurance do not cover it in the shoulder and there's insufficient evidence to support its use. So when conservative management fails, we move on to arthroplasty. And this is an example of a woman who had a shoulder replacement 14 years ago. And she had debilitating pain. And we were able to reconstruct the shoulder by putting in a metal prosthesis with a stem that goes into the shaft and then a plastic socket. At the time of her surgery, she was 84 and was on narcotics. And we were able to get her back to a point where she had restoration of motion and pain-free function, was very happy, and then actually wound up coming back four years later to do her other side. 
So as a background, over 7,000, and, and this number is growing rapidly with the demographics of our nation. Our shoulder replacements are performed annually in the United States. Our goals are pain relief and to give patients optimal shoulder function. The technical points are to restore the anatomy as well as we possibly can, and then balance the soft tissues so that motion is improved. So how well does it work? This is a study that's now just about 20 years old from the University of Washington in Seattle. And they found that when they looked at 128 shoulders at three to five year follow-up, on average, patients regained two thirds of the functions that they didn't have before surgery, a 73% chance of regaining the function that was absent before surgery, and the chance of losing a function that they had before surgery was only 6%. So these are good surgeries that are dramatically effective in improving patients' quality of life. I'm very lucky to love what I do, and there are many things that I like about my practice as a, as a shoulder specialist, but in particular, one of them over time has been arthroplasty, because we can really take patients that are suffering in pain, that have difficulty sometimes holding a train of thought during a dinner party because of their shoulder pain, that are losing sleep, that have trouble getting dressed, that have trouble shopping and doing daily activities, and we can take away their pain, and those are really happy people. So uh, this is an old slide that just simply says both total and partial shoulder replacement improve disease specific and general quality of life measurements two years after surgery. What I want you to take away from this is really simple. We don't do partial shoulder replacements unless it's an exceedingly rare circumstance. Total shoulder arthroplasty is the standard, whether it's an anatomic or reverse, and we'll, we'll discuss that for a minute. But the takeaway from this slide is, when we try to look at value in orthopedics and medicine and healthcare, we want to try to assess what's the impact of an operation. Does this operation restore something that a patient didn't have and enable them to have a better quality of life, to participate in society, to be more independent, to be more functional, to be more happy, to work, to interact with their family, to lead a better quality of life? And that's called a quality. And this is data that shows when you look at these validated outcomes measures, total shoulder arthroplasty is incredibly effective and durable in doing that. So here you see a very straightforward case of a 79-year-old female with end-stage arthritis. She's got joint space obliteration. She has subchondral sclerosis, which is that whitening. She's got a very small osteophyte here. She does not have a big bone spur. And her MRI shows a normal rotator cuff. She no longer has any pain relief with non-steroidals or injections, and, and she's really having a tough time. So this is a perfect candidate. So here you look at her preoperative images, and then you look at her postoperative images, and she has essentially an anatomic reconstruction where we put this stem down the canal, we put a plastic glenoid component which resurfaces the socket and that is cemented in place with pegs that go into the socket and drill holes and here she is at about two to three months out from surgery now she she was really a superstar and had a very quick recovery not everybody in three months has got their arm up over their head but she did great here's another example of a little bit more of a challenging case this patient had an old fracture and so you can see that there's an angular deformity here. There's joint space obliteration. There's an extremely large bone spur here. And then she has a compromised rotator cuff with this large loose body here between the shoulder blade and the humerus. So for her, we do a reverse shoulder replacement where we do a reconstruction. We put a prosthesis down, and unfortunately we're having a little bit of trouble with this video, but basically, after the surgery, she's able to elevate her arm, she's able to brush her hair, she's able to live her life and has no pain. So in the operating room, there's several steps that we take to make patients safe. What are they and how has shoulder arthroplasty improved over the last 20 years since I started doing it as a resident? Well, the first and foremost that has the greatest impact on your experience as a patient is a regional anesthetic. So at Sibley, the anesthesiologist meets you in the preoperative area, discusses the plan of care, and it involves taking an ultrasound probe and putting that on your neck, finding the nerves that come out of your neck and go down into the arm. With that ultrasound probe, they can precisely deliver local anesthetic there to give a block 
and in most cases, put a very small catheter that's basically like an angel hair pasta noodle under the neck adjacent to the nerves that simply drips additional local anesthetic for three days. And this is really transformative because when you wake up from surgery, you're having minimal discomfort and that typically lasts for three days. That allows you to get up and ambulate with the nurse and physical therapy and then go home on the day after surgery. Many patients even go home the day of surgery and then they have good pain control from the catheter. They also take narcotic pain medication because we're aggressive in controlling pain. But on day three, they remove the catheter and because they're three days out from surgery, they're simply not having the difficulty that other patients did in the past when they would wake up without any block, without any catheter or numbing medicine. The surgery is done in what we call a beach chair position and, and this is a modified beach chair that's a little more reclined. We wear spacesuits in the operating room, as you can see in this picture, because it's a hypersterile environment. Because we're putting a prosthesis in, the risk of infection is very real. Fortunately, at Sibley and with our team, that risk is low, and there are multiple steps. So I prep your, well, let's start with the night before, three days before. Patients will put benzoyl peroxide on their skin approximately three days before surgery. That's been shown in the literature, just simple, very similar to Clearasil. That, that somebody would use with acne because there's a type of bacteria that is not on the skin, but beneath the skin. And so we put benzoyl peroxide on for a couple of days before surgery. The night before surgery and the morning of surgery, you use special chlorhexidine cloths in the shower. And you go from the side of your face, around the ear, the back, across the chest, onto the back, the arm, the armpit, and down on the side of the torso. So the prep begins before you even get to the hospital. When you're at the hospital, an IV line is started, intravenous antibiotics are started before surgery, you go back to the operating room, and then I scrub your skin down with alcohol before the nurses do. We position, we prep you, the nurse scrubs and preps you, and then I prep you again. And then we take your body and we drape it out, and then we cover it so there's no skin showing whatsoever in the room. You're covered with this essentially enormous scotch tape, this roll of like packing tape, like you're an Amazon package, but the tape is encoded with an antibacterial material similar to iodine. And so that increases sterility of the field. We then use betadine lavage, which has been further shown to reduce the risk of infection. And we put antibiotic powder into the wound and we use liters of irrigation during the procedure and have all of these protocols to make that risk of infection as close to zero as possible. Unfortunately, it can never be zero, but we can get it pretty darn close. So when we do the procedure itself, we'll just briefly show some pictures here. We work in the anterior interval between the deltoid on the side of the shoulder and the pectoralis here. And just like on my blazer, there's an interval there that goes in between nervous planes. And so we can pull the deltoid to the side, we can pull the pectoralis to the side, and that gives us access to the shoulder. We then have different options, but basically we go through the tendon in the front. We can incise it, we can peel it, or we can release the bone here. Those have all been shown to be equivalent, but we've got to now open the door by going through that tendon to get into the room of the shoulder. We're then going to remove osteophytes or the bone spurs that you're seeing on the x-ray here. And, and that's, you know, straightforwardly done so that you can identify the anatomic neck where the head meets the shaft. And then we're going to make a cut. And that cut's made with a saw so that we can then get to the socket and do an anatomic reconstruction. And that's what you see here with precise instrumentation. So this is what that looks like. This is a patient who, uh, when I last saw him, was 13 years out and uh, doing beautifully now in his 90s, able to return to push-ups after his replacement. I said to him, look, I'm really glad you're doing push-ups, but personally, I'd prefer you to do that. It places a load across the socket that, that really isn't ideal for longevity because longevity is what I want you to have as a patient after your replacement. Here are other examples of patients with deformity. And so let's talk quickly, 
all of these are great things. It's really exciting, it's fun, we can really help people. What are the problems with it? Well, the biggest problem with an anatomic shoulder replacement where you're using a traditional ball and socket is the fact that the glenoid, the socket side, can loosen and wear. And we fix it with glue, and the glue is highly evolved and studied and, and designed to provide as much stability as possible. But this is where failure typically happens, is on the glenoid side. And some patients will have a glenoid that lasts 25 years, and other patients can have a glenoid that only lasts seven to 10 years. And there's lots of ongoing research trying to optimize that. The other issues are erosion of the socket that we had alluded to before. So if I have wear on my socket and my head starts to slide out the back, as you can see in this MRI here, the head is sliding out the back, I'm gonna erode the back of the socket. And so that distorts the anatomy, stretches the tissues, and can then, you know, the best way to describe this is think of an aircraft carrier in the water. If, if the hull of the boat is down here, and this is the deck where the planes are landing. Well, if the carrier started to list, it's pretty hard for a plane to land on there and stay on the runway. And that's what we're trying to do when we put the socket on. And that's what you see here in this illustration. So we've got strategies and fortunately technology helps us quite a bit with CAT scans that enable us to develop three dimensional reconstructions and planning for surgery. And that's patient specific instrumentation. There's several different companies we use that make this, but, but really simply, the best solutions for any problem are gonna be the simplest ones because they wind up being the most elegant. So this technology has been validated now for years and something we've used at Sibley for over 10 years that takes a three-dimensional image of each individual patient's shoulder, puts it into a computer digitally, and then allows me to model it prior to the surgery so I can plan, as you see here, where I'm gonna put my components precisely. And then I get a guide from that that I can use in the operating room that's going to attach on to each individual patient's shoulder so I can more reproducibly perform the operation as I plan it and I can anticipate potential problems in advance. So when we talk about complications, the estimated complication rate is 5%, but that includes lots of different types of complications. I would say I think it's actually a bit lower than this with careful patient selection. They include loosening of the glenoid, that subscapularis repair can sometimes fail, problems with the tuberosity, which is the attachment site of the rotator cuff, nerve injuries, anesthesia complications, and other issues. I want to speak very quickly about the reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Plain and simple, we started with the rotator cuff and then we went to replacement for arthritis. Well, in patients who don't have a rotator cuff, a traditional ball and socket replacement is not going to work because the rotator cuff can't keep the head centered in the socket. So the French developed an alternative to this, which is to put a ball on the socket side and a cup on the humeral side that then rotates around using the deltoid and therefore is not reliant on the rotator cuff. So this is a fantastic technique that we've had great success with. Here you see a video that's working of a patient who had a reverse shoulder replacement two years previously. And so she's had complete restoration of function. She has a stable shoulder. She's happy and back to her life. This powerful technique though also enables us to take care of patients that have more difficult problems such as bad fractures. Here you see uh, a very bad fracture that went on to be a malunion where it healed but in the wrong position, completely distorting the joint with pain. And then here you see a really interesting example. This was a special patient at Sibley. She was approximately 40 years out from a radical mastectomy, which is a procedure that's really not done anymore. But what you're looking at in the picture on the right is they had taken her entire pectoralis, all the tissues down to her chest wall. And so she had profound arthritis and pain here with a dysfunctional rotator cuff and then lymphedema in her arm. And by working together as a team, we were able to replace her shoulder with a reverse shoulder replacement restore her function, and then control her lymphedema, which uh, was quite a bit of fun. 
So thank you for coming and I hope this is helpful.